everybody. So to start this session, I'd like to do something a little bit different. I'd like you to take a piece of paper, you know, something really simple like this, or your telephone, or if you want to be super fancy, your iPad. And I'd like you to write down what your company objectives are over the next few years. So we'll give ourselves 10 seconds for that one. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is write underneath that, um, write down what your team's objectives are. So that's likely going to be a little bit easier. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is put a little tick next to the ones that are a little, that you really enjoy, that you know, when you get to the office in the morning, you think, yes, I want to achieve this objective. And I'd like you to put a cross, or it could be a frowny smiley, next to the ones that, you know, are a bit meh, or I have to do them because I have to do them. Okay, so does your paper look anything like this? Because if it does, don't worry, you're in good company. In a survey of 11,000 executives by the London Business School, they found that top executives were actually not that good at telling what their company objectives were. The majority couldn't even um, name all the objectives and only just about 50% could name even just one. Now, if your paper looks something like this, then genuinely well done, because actually this is super duper difficult. And by the way, would you like to do an interview? Because we'd love to know how you actually managed to do this. So what if I told you that there's a way for you to get to this version or closer to this version? And more interestingly enough, that you could actually connect these things together. So the company, the team, and the ticks on the side. I have a confession to make. Um, as the director of uh, digital content for Planisware, I do a lot of exploratory work and I hate goals. They're either too uh, tight, too restrictive, um, too, you know, uncomfortable. If you pick them too small, then the work is uninteresting, you're not motivated, and it's very difficult to not be distracted by the next shiny thing. If you pick them too big, then um, it's demotivating because you know you're never going to achieve them. Sometimes I'll follow what I thought was the good goal, and I'm not going to get where I want to be. And then I do my best work when I go completely off track and end up miles ahead of where I was expecting to go. The thing is, I do actually believe like Andy Grove that ideas are cheap, but execution is everything. You, and you can't have excellent uh, execution without some sort of an endpoint, um, a target or a vision. A clear goal puts you in the right mindset to succeed. It federates the team, it puts them, uh, pulls them forward. Um, the goals are also a way for you to benchmark uh, yourself and assess your progress. In a two-year Deloitte study, factor, the, the factor that had most impact on employee engagement was clearly defined goals that were written and uh, easily available. Um, and this really shows how important goals can be um, on employees' job satisfaction and on overall the way people perform projects. So I was intrigued, you can imagine, when I came across um, this idea that there might be an approach that could solve all these issues that I had with goals. Um, as you know, if you've read one of my articles or if you're signed up to the Monthly Hub, then you know how enthusiastic I get about um, unconventional, remarkable ideas uh, that can help solve uh, our current problems. And to me, OKRs are both. It takes an old, everyday, boring idea, goals, and transforms them as a tool for today's world. So what are OKRs? Well, it's objectives plus key results. So there are two components in it, and they help you build um, a new approach to a goal setting for your company, your team, and the individuals who work for it. It allows alignment at all levels of the organization, 
And the goal setting is in an open, public, collaborative way that is oriented towards growth. And we'll see that this is actually a really interesting combination. So, OK, now I know you back there, you're saying, come on, Alexandra. You know, OKRs okay, are just MBOs in new shiny clothes. And if you focus on the name and the objects that they describe, that's a pretty logical conclusion. What I want to show to you today, the one idea I would like you to remember, is that OKRs by themselves, so just the little objective and key results as they are written, are only half of the, the approach. The other 50% of the approach is what makes OKRs special. So it's the conversations that they generate. It's the way that they force you to ruthlessly focus on the things that are going to move your business forward. It's the way that it builds habits in your team, um, the networks that it creates across your organization, so horizontally, vertically, diagonally. Um, and it's the way also it forces you th to think differently from an output-based approach to an outcome-based approach. So before I, we go into greater detail, um, let's do a little reality check here. You know, just so that you know that I'm not high on psychedelics, or if I am high on psychedelics, I'm not the only one. This is what Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, has to say about OKRs. OKRs have helped us lead us to 10 times growth many times over. They have helped make our crazily bold mission of organizing the world's information perhaps even achievable. They've kept me and the rest of the company on time and on track when it mattered the most. That's a pretty decent endorsement, don't you think? It's actually almost a little bit too good to be true. When I first discovered the OKRs, my first reflex was, well, if this stuff is so awesome, how come that I never heard about it earlier? And when you think about it, the fundamentals were invented, if you can put it that way, by Andy Grove, uh, the legendary CEO of Intel in the 1980s. Google, the company everybody wants to be when they grow up, um, has been using them for 20 years. And at this stage in my thinking, I've come to the conclusion that until fairly recently, the general business world didn't actually need um, OKRs. And that's why they remained um, the province of tech companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Salesforce. Today, the boundaries between what is a tech company and what is a regular business are increasingly blurred. Techniques that used to be um, really something that was purely for tech, like um, uh, agile methodologies or uh, remote teams as a, as a fact of life, are increasingly coming into the um, regular business practices. And um, as a result, something different is needed. We've also got, the, with COVID, this sudden imperative to do this thing called digital transformation, as opposed to just talking about it. And um, there's also been a return for, to a more volatile, less predictable world. So OKRs are an interesting solution to um, some of the newer challenges that are cropping up again, uh, around us um, in this new disturbed context. Um, it's a tool for today's post-pandemic, uncertain and complex world, where tomorrow um, we might all be considered tech companies by today's standards. So let's dive into what makes um, OKR such an interesting idea. So um, the first thing is that you'll notice that I'll, I usually say throughout this presentation that OKRs is an approach, not a methodology. And the reason for that is that it's actually a very flexible um, tool. You can adapt it, you should adapt it to your company. And there are some things that are non-negotiable, but outside of these boundaries, you can do pretty much anything that you want. So what are these famous objectives and key results? Well, they are the fundamental uh, building blocks of the OKR approach. So you've got the O, and then you've got the KR. So that objectives and key results. Objectives are what needs to be achieved, and the key results are how we're going to achieve this. So either you meet a key result or you don't, but there's no room for doubt. Key results evolve as the work progresses, and when they are completed, in theory, the objective is necessarily completed. I say in theory because 
I would say that most of us have got objectives that are quite broad and it's an ongoing, ever continuing world, basically, We're always working on these objectives. The best way to explain this would be the way that um, Andy Grove explained it to Jim Lally. Um, Jim Lally was one of the original people on the Intel team. He wasn't quite convinced about this whole thing. So um, Grove sat down with him and explained the following thing. So let's imagine that you want everyone to go to the center of Europe. And some of them go marching off to Germany, some go to France, some go to Italy. The problem is you actually wanted them to go to Switzerland. Um, so you're a little bit in trouble there. Another way to explain it is that uh, from, I know there are so many engineers in the, that are going to be watching this presentation. So in mathematical terms, um, it's as if you had vectors going in all sorts of directions, they end up canceling uh, each other out. Whereas if you've got a strong direction in which to go, then they add up to one another and they maximize results. So um, the uh, um, objective is the direction and the key results are the milestones. When they are well designed, uh, an objective will really motivate people to go out there and actually do this thing, you know, Nike, just do it. Okay, I'll surface the important core goals that you've got. Um, and the kicker here is that you're not actually allowed as many as you want. Um, the ideal is like two, three, maybe. Um, you might go up to five, but um, you're actually meant to focus on these few uh, specific goals. Um, and then when you've got a well-designed key result, um, it's a challenge in its own right. So it's not impossible to achieve, but it's actually quite difficult. Uh, you might be a bit worried that you're not actually going to make it. As Marissa Mayer um, put it, um, it's not a key result if it doesn't have a number. So to move forward, we need to touch upon two further f uh, features of OKRs. And the first one is that OKRs cascade, but not in a linear way. So you will have the CEO, the C-suite, or the directors that will be setting the OKRs. Um, and they will discuss a lot around what would be the two, three key objectives. It's not an easy thing. It's actually probably going to be your first big challenge if you decide to implement OKRs. Then the rest of the company will start building their OKRs based on those uh, primary OKRs. So it's not only a top-down mechanism. There's also a bottom-up um, effect. And that's how you get those key conversations that move the business forward. And this is really important. So um, Dor explains this as follows. He says that innovation tends to dwell at the edges of the organization, that people in the trenches um, are in contact with impending changes early. And if you're not reintegrated this information in your general flow of information, you're probably losing out on one of your best sources of innovation and operational excellence. So you don't need to uh, anchor your OKR on your boss's OKRs. And that's another feature that's really interesting. It can jump, you can jump, you can attach your OKRs to maybe um, another teams, another department. Um, it could even be to another business unit. And that's where you find your networks, your new connections, and that's the beginning of your alignment. So you might be wondering, how do people actually know everybody else's OKRs? You know, you know they, they won't guess them. Um, so that's the second component, and it's radical transparency. So from the CEO to the latest hire, fresh out of school, um, everybody can see everybody else's um, OKRs. So it's not just the OKRs of your department, it's also the OKRs in the next business unit, it's the OKRs of the executive committee, it's the OKRs of, you know, that guy you meet at coffee every day. You're probably wondering, so why do we need to be that radically transparent? Why not create sort of silos, um, maybe just by business units? And actually, in practice, that's often what will happen in really large organisations, but 
you shouldn't encourage it at all. You should actually stick to being as transparent as possible. My take on it is that radical transparency is a catalyst for all sorts of things that you want for excellence in a company. So let's give an example, trust, for example. Trust is a shortcut to employee engagement. It's also a shortcut to flexibility, because when you know that your team's going to follow you, you're more willing to go and get that risk. It's also um, a shortcut to resilience, and ultimately, it allows you to seize opportunities. Trust, um, one example. Um, if I don't trust my manager to listen when I come up with a new idea, why just mention the new idea? Um, in the same way, if I can't trust that I will be evaluated by the same criteria as my male colleague next to me, why would I put the extra effort in it? The system is biased against me anyway. So trust is really key. Another element is the ability to see when people are going off track. So the best way of explaining this is the way Aaron Levy, uh, the CEO of Box, explains it. He says, at, every sorry, at any given time, some significant percentage of people are working on the wrong things. The challenge is knowing which ones. So because you can see what people focus on in real time, you can see straight away when a department or a team is going off track before they've invested too much into the work. Um, and going off track is easy, especially if you've got particularly motivated people. If you think about it, especially when you're doing exploratory work, you've got people who really want to go, and they, they want to tackle the challenge. They will often come with completely different solutions or sometimes slightly different solutions. And if you start having um, all these different, slightly different perspectives, after a while they add up and the vectors cancel themselves out. So some initiatives may end up thwarting other initiatives completely unintentionally. And it's not because the people were doing it on purpose, it's just that they were so enthusiastic about it, they went with their way of doing things. Another final element that's really, really useful is that by seeing everybody else's goals, you can see duplicate work. It often happens that within an organization, something is going to be necessary at the same time for several departments. So for instance, at Planus, where at one point, we found ourselves with doing extensive video work um, for four completely different departments. And the objectives were not the same, but we were having the same problems in terms of equipment, methodology, approach to how we were doing these videos. So when you can see people's goals, what is important uh, to them um, right now, you can limit duplicate work. You might even be able to eliminate it. So radical transparency strengthens the links between different parts of the organization. And the best example really is the headquarters versus subsidiary issue. Um, have you ever been at headquarters and then scratching your head and sort of thinking, why did that team, that local team, do things that way? And you go, that's weird. Or have you been on the other side of the divide and going in, in a subsidiary and going, what on earth are they doing at headquarters? I mean, who on earth came up with this plan? When you can actually see what people's objectives and their focus is, then you're starting to have more visibility about what's happening in all sorts of different parts of the organization. And it's not necessarily just a um, result of geographical distance. Um, I mean, an example at Planisware, Planisware Marketing and Development share the same floor, but we're at two different sides of the building, and we've had some epic misunderstandings in the past. Atticus Tyson, the CIO of Intuit, um, put it this way, OKRs ended the mystery. They made us more coherent, and they brought us together. So, an example, let's say that you're IT and you've seen in uh, HR's objectives that they are planning on increasing the workforce in this particular office by 15%. You might need to uh, scale up some parts of the networks. And if you're in a post-COVID world, that might need buying equipment that's particularly difficult to come across. Another example might be if you're part of the team that deals with invoicing and you learn that development is working on this new product that's going to generate a large volume of small invoices, then you might need to hire and train someone before 
the deluge of invoices arrives and you find yourself having to deal with it in a catastrophe. So being able to see what other departments are doing is a way to improve the efficiency of your own department. I might even go so far as to say that this next point is the most important. When you can see where your position is compared to all the others around, it gives context to the work that you're doing. It connect, when you can see how your work connects to the other moving pieces, um, how it fits within the organisation, all of a sudden it adds some meaning to your work. And meaning is definitely something that is very necessary in today's company. Okay, so now say you've got your shine, new shiny OKRs. They're fully connected, fully aligned. Uh, they've been established by collaboration and uh, they're available for everybody to see. Now what? Well, the risk is that they go the way of all goals, which is down in a drawer where nobody will see them again until they are pulled out, dusted, and promptly declared either um, obsolete or failed. So what we need is a way to keep these OKRs uh, alive and thriving. And you do that through a combination of cadence, which is the rhythm at which you're going to do things relating to these OKRs, and close follow-up. So typically, it will look something like this. You can see here that you've got several cycles that are one on top of the other. You have an annual cycle um, where it, you will have the objectives at the company level will be, de will be determined and shared and communicated within the organization. And then you have a second cycle, which is qu quite often a um, quarterly qu um, cycle. That's the way that we do it in, in my team. And um, you will have, therefore, four OKR uh, team cycles or individual cycles within one large company cycle. So why, you know, quarterly? On top of the fact that we're all obsessed with quarters uh, because of the various um, organizations that we've got. Well, um, three months is just enough to get some real work done, but it's just short enough so that if you're going in the wrong direction, you can see it. So you'll notice also on this diagram um, towards the right there, you've got this red line that says track progress. And yes, bad news. This actually means more meetings. So this is the second part of it. It's tracking your OKRs. You have more meetings, but they don't have to be soulless uh, dead meetings. Actually, um, in my team, I'd say that you know, these meetings are some of the more, most interesting ones for developing team spirit and um, a free flow of information. We have them the first thing on Monday morning. Uh, we somehow always end up spending a significant amount of time talking about weekends. But then, instead of focusing on the dry facts of the tasks that we're going to do, we're actually focusing on how we can get our OKRs to move forward. And what will naturally happen is that we will talk about these other things, these tasks, but the heart of the conversation will be moving forward, getting those OKRs realized by the end of the period. So um, the way that this works ideally is that by focusing on OKRs, you're going to make your meetings more dynamic because they're really oriented towards achieving this and not just ticking things off your to-do list. We also have at the end of the week um, something called the win session. And basically, we will go through one or two wins that we've had uh, in the previous week. So it could be you know, record number of uh, registrants for an event. Um, well, after all, we work in digital content. Um, it could be that we've got this fantastic new white paper coming out. Hint, hint. Um, but it could also be that one of us has acquired a new skill or one of us has made a key step forward um, in achieving uh, the objective. Before we finish, um, I'd like to share with you maybe my favorite feature about OKRs, and that is that OKRs are a way to stretch the organization um, in a sustainable way. So change is actually probably one of the most underestimated, um, more, most complex equation that the company um, has to face, at least in my opinion. It's a little bit a Goldilocks problem because you need to be fast enough to maintain the trajectory, but slow enough that you don't burn out the company. You need to be um, 
ambitious enough and idealistic enough to go after those disruptive innovations, you also need to be pragmatic enough to keep the lights on while you're reaching for those goals. One of the other problems with growth is that it's really hard to steer. Um, because OKRs focus on the next most important things coming up. And because it lays down how we're going to get there, it allows you to course correct, you know, small course corrections throughout um, your search to achieve this objective. So it's a way to steer growth a little bit more granularly instead of sort of just diving into it and then discovering after a, month, a year, um, maybe, you know, a year and a half that you're going in the absolute wrong direction. One of the other important things of OKRs is that you're not actually meant to achieve 100% of them. You're only meant to achieve 70%. That's usually the benchmark. So the idea is that if you achieve consistently 80-90% of your OKRs, it means that you're not ambitious enough. And if you can only reach like 40-50%, to 50%, it's either that you're too ambitious, which happens a lot, or that you don't have the resources nece necessary to go after that objective. So um, this is a really important thing um, for another reason. If you've spoken to me about OKRs, you'll know that I also see in it something really useful for the perfectionists among us because it forces us to face failure on a regular basis. But that's maybe for another discussion. Another thing that's for another discussion also is that OKRs should be divorced from compensation or at least should not account for all of uh, your compensation, your bonuses. Uh, the reason for that, obviously, is that if you're asking people to fail 30% of the time, you can't turn around and say, sorry, guy, you know, you fail 30% of the time, you won't get your bonus. So we have reaching the end of this, pre uh, this presentation, so let's summarise. OKRs are a great way to evolve your goals in a way that is more suitable for today's world. Because it's very modular, very flexible, it's got different timelines, it connects the organisation together, it's a great way to go after growth um, and to sort of maintain this upward trajectory in a way that is sustainable for the teams. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the one thing that I'd like you to remember if you decide to look deeper into OKRs, is that the actual objectives and key results only represent 50%, might even represent less than that, of um, the overall process. And if you forget the other 50%, the implementation, the conversations, and all these elements, you're actually going to lose a lot of the interest. You're probably going to revert to MBOs to some extent. And you're also going to lose a lot of the subtlety of the um, approach. OKRs fundamentally are easy, they're easy to explain, um, pretty easy to understand, but it's when you start implementing them that you start to see how all the different pieces fit together and how each piece is important. So thank you very much for listening to this session. Um, we will now be taking questions in the Q&A panel. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got. And also, we will be coming up with a series on uh, the Planet Square Hub, um, white papers and some blog posts on this topic and how specifically they apply to project management and um, project portfolio management. So stay tuned. <laughs>